Again, we have some pretty, pretty great things we want to get to you today through uh, a great panel of people. Pastor David's going to join me, uh, of course, Jordan and uh, Cindy, my wife, and we're going to talk a little bit about where we've been, where we are today, where we're headed, uh, and uh, can't wait to get to that, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about just the gathering. I want to talk to you a little bit about church. Uh, we, we started the new year in a series we, uh, we called Our Disciplined Response. We just talked about um, our faith, where our faith takes us, where our faith motivates us. It motivates us to change. It motivates us to transformation. It motivates us to good works. It motivates us to be doers of the Word and not just hearers of the Word. And uh, we can't, you can't have a conversation about discipline response without including, uh, certainly mentioning the church and our participation in it. I bet you know this verse. It's in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. But when the writer of the book of Hebrews wrote uh, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, which some were doing more and more frequently when he wrote that letter at the time, he wasn't simply counting heads, wasn't taking role. He he wasn't stressing uh, the importance of church attendance. He wasn't trying to build the biggest church in the area when he urged people not to miss church, when the church was meeting together and the church was was gathering. He was actually saving lives. He was working to save men's lives. Because even in his day, he could see the words of Jesus being fulfilled that the love of many was beginning to wax cold. Some of us in this room probably don't think that could touch us, but I think we would be deceived thinking that. I don't think we need to be afraid of losing our love for God, but we need to be prepared because the spirit of the world is always at work to that end, to break break the connection between us and God, to sour the fellowship that can be so rich at times that we can't even stand on our feet, we have to go to the floor because our fellowship and our experience uh, in fellowship with God is so, so very rich and over, overwhelming. Jesus made that available. Uh, so when uh, the writer of Hebrews wrote, he had a number of people who were, uh, as he addressed, were, were no longer meeting together as frequently as they once uh, met together. Many of them were beginning to wonder whether or not Jesus really was who he said he was, a very strong warning in Hebrews, the sixth chapter to us. What is the sixth chapter to us about uh, people renouncing Christ? And so the writer just says, hey, hey, don't forget the things you've learned and don't neglect getting together when you have the opportunity to get together. Here's the verse, Hebrews 10, 25, from the Passion Translation. He says that this is not the time. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together, as some have formed the habit of doing, because we need each other. Say that we need each other. It's a biblical fact. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning, referring to the last day. The present trend, I don't know if you know this or not, even aware of it, but the present trend among many believers is to profess deep love for Jesus, but not his church. I love Jesus, but I don't love church. Uh, And I hear that, and I, I can identify that because, honestly, I used to be one of those people. I can remember a handwritten note I wrote in pencil to a man who was urging me to come to church and get involved in church and be a part of the assembly here in Albuquerque. And I wrote him back a heartfelt, sincere letter, handwritten letter, quoting verses in the Bible, trying to prove that Jesus was my shepherd and I didn't need a pastor. I worked hard at it. I thought it was a great letter. I'm sure it grieved the Spirit of God. 
And I know the pastor who received it tore it up, and rightly so. I hope he prayed for me because I needed a change of heart. I needed to change my mind. And thank God it, it happened long before I was ever called to do this, to actually pastor a church myself. But that's the present trend, and I, I'm just here to tell, it's oversimplifying it for some of you, but I'm here to tell you that you can't love Jesus and not love his church. You cannot, it cannot be done. I'm going to save you some time, save you some heartache. It simply cannot be done. You're only kidding yourself to say, I love Jesus with all my heart, but I don't love his church. You can't value Jesus and follow after him and not embrace his values. That's part of following Jesus as a disciple, is we take up what's most important to him. And Jesus values the church. He gave his life to give birth to it. That happened on the day of Pentecost after his resurrection. But did you know he is still giving his life from the right hand of the heavenly Father for his church? He intercedes, up, he intercedes for us to be saved to the uttermost. He is still working from the right hand of the Father through all of us to build a church, to gather a family from all nations to present to the Father. Jesus is doing that uh, even as we're here this morning. I'm certain like you, he doesn't care for everything that we've made the church out to be. Men's efforts replacing those of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, his commitment to the church is unwavering. We sang and celebrated as well we should his faithfulness this morning. Again, what a great song. Our commitment as members of the church family, our commitment should be unwavering as well. As goes our love for Jesus, so goes our love for his church. I say this without apology. I know absolutely it is the truth when I declare it, that if your love is deepening for Jesus, it is deepening for his church. I'll say it again. If your love truly is deepening for Jesus, then it is also deepening for his church. He loves his church. Pastor David um, spoke on this, I think it was sometime last year, and he made a statement, and I asked him for it as I prepared for this morning. I wrote it in. I wrote part of it down in my notes. I couldn't write it fast enough. So I asked him for the full statement, and he is obliged. And here's what he said. The church of Jesus Christ is one family, one body, one tribe. To the degree we live apart from the local church, we sabotage our own spiritual health and development. And we hold back the mission of Jesus in the world today. Outstanding statement. You should take a screenshot of that. Go ahead, you have my permission. Don't do what I did and try to write it down. The Church of Jesus Christ, one family, one body, one tribe, the degree we live apart from the local church. We sabotage our own spiritual health and development, and we hold back the mission of Jesus in the world today. Three reasons why we should love the church. You ready? Number one, Jesus loves his church, and it pleases him when I do. Religion uh, is, uh, regularly gets a bad rap in the Bible, but the church doesn't. Even when Jesus steps up to correct the church in the book of Revelation, there are seven churches mentioned and they're receiving a corrective word. We know it's a discipline thing, and, and God disciplines those who he loves. The Bible teaches that. So he's not just slamming the church he's building. He's doing something more for the church when he corrects the church, when we read about it. On the other hand, religion is pretty much worthless, men's religion. And we want to do everything we can to be cleansed of their ideas and uh, their reasonings and their pursuit of God, which by and large is based on good works instead of faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I don't want to be religious. Jesus didn't die to make me religious. He didn't die to make you religious. He died to give you his own way of life. Amen. Number two, it's not just Jesus' family, it's mine. 
It's not just Jesus' family. It's mine. You and I have a place that we belong. I've given, I have a God-given place among the many here this morning and around the world. I have a special place. God has cleared out a spot for me, and he has set me in his church is what the Bible teaches. The word set in the Greek language is the same word used to describe God setting Jesus at his own right hand after the resurrection. Same word, not a different word, with the same thoughtfulness, the same strength, the same power. He has set you and set me in a place, a particular place in his church family. Again, it's important to him. It should be very important to us to take up our place and to take up our position. Amen? Archimedes, who was a Greek philosopher, a great mathematician, he's the one who developed the whole idea of the lever and using the lever to move sometimes immovable objects. He made this statement. He said, give me a, a place to stand and I will move the earth. Now, God has given us a place in Christ, in his church, and we can move the mountains. Come on. We can move the mountains from the place that God has given us. Pastor David also said, you know, just there are just too many Christians who are just like a finger dangling out in space by themselves. And they're confused as to why their life lacks meaning and connection. It's because a finger is supposed to be attached to the hand, a hand attached to the arm, the arm attached appropriately to the torso. Isn't that right? And God is just by design... Just think about his creation, all of it. By design, he has made something to touch something else appropriately. Sin moves us into a place of touching things inappropriately, people inappropriately. But the Spirit of God, by design, wants us joined one to another appropriately. Somebody's going to always say, Pastor, it's a big risk. You know, I've been hurt in church. Get in line. Dear Jesus, please, it's time to get past that. We can help you with that. I've been hurt in church. My, I can say this. My deepest hurts in life have come here, right here, in this house. But I've also been healed in church. Pick, choose. I've been hurt, but I've been healed. I'm still here. You should still be here. And those of you who are listening by streaming and our streaming audience who are sitting at home today because you've been wounded, you've been hurt, you know, your heart is not at a great place, come back to church. There are people that love you. I can vouch for these in this room. They'll love you. They'll hug you. They'll pray for you. They'll stand with you. They'll help you in every way um, just because they love Jesus. Number three, and I'm done. There's simply nothing like the church on the planet. There's just no better idea. Now, that's a real um, sort of casual way to say it. It's more than that because Ephesians 3 teaches that God has actually chosen to demonstrate his incredible love and his power, his might. The King James Version uses the phrase manifold wisdom through the church. He wants to fill us with his fullness so that we can take his fullness to every corner, every dark corner, every place on the planet. You know, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, once criticized Christians by saying this. He said, you Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all the civilization to pieces, turn the world upside down, and bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it as nothing more than a piece of good literature. We not only treat the Bible that way sometimes, but we, we treat this great gathering called the church that way. We take it for granted. It's low on our priority list, and we shouldn't. Our love for Jesus will not allow it. It won't allow it. Church doesn't take anything away from your family. So when you're scheduling family activities, don't put church last on your list. Your kids need to know about Jesus. 
Not more than you, but they need to know about Jesus. Our grandkids need to know about Jesus. Hebrews 6.10, Hebrews 6.10 through 12 says this, For God, the faithful one, is not unfair. How can he forget the work you've done for him? He remembers the love you demonstrate as you continually serve his beloved ones for the glory of his name. But we long to see you passionately advance until the end and you find hope fulfilled. So don't allow your hearts to grow dull or lose enthusiasm, but follow the example of those who fully receive what God has promised because of their strong faith and patient in endurance. I celebrate the awesomeness of church. It is my great privilege, and it is your great privilege to serve Jesus by serving his church and serving one another. It's not something, we just read it, it's not something he will ever, ever forget. So I'm going to charge you, don't lose your heart to other things. Don't grow dull. Don't let it grow dull. Don't lose your enthusiasm concerning church. If you need cheering up when you get here, we'll help you. But, but if you can, come, through the, come busting through those doors, already celebrating, already dancing, already with your hands uplifted, praising God and worshiping God. Let's just start off on that note as often as we possibly can. Amen. Don't lose your enthusiasm for what God is doing here. You know, Cindy and I, back in 1980, when we were privileged to give birth to this church by the Holy Ghost, uh, we, we committed ourselves to doing what's hard. In fact, our prayer continues to be, God, let us go to places where nobody else will go. Not, that's not pride speaking. God, help us to do what's not getting done. Help us to be that church. Make us that somebody who will obey what you need done at any point at any time. And working at relationships, handling what we sometimes, I I sometimes refer to the messiness of community life, because it can get messy, okay? Handling that sometimes is the hard work. But Cindy and I remain committed to it. I know many of you do. Its rewards are eternal. So I want our panel to come and join us on the platform again for the remainder of uh, the morning. Would you welcome them as they come? And uh, we're going to visit just a little. Our part, we'll just visit here a little bit. We're all just kind of jump in, right, guys? Yes. Just kind of jump in. This is not. We actually have a few things written down. We don't know what's going to happen beyond that. Okay. <laughs> We just, uh, we wanted to do this. We wanted just to have a conversation with all of you. And, you know, God has done some pretty great things over 40 years. Some of you have been with us, maybe not the entire 40, but some of you have been with us 38 years. Some of you have been with us 38 minutes. (laughs) And a lot of in between. And we're happy. We're happy to celebrate what God is, is doing and we don't believe at all that he's finished. Our, I don't, we don't believe at all that our greatest days are in our past. And yet there are many, many great things that we have to celebrate right. uh, in our past. And most of that is people. It's, it's not coming to town with $300. It's all you had. It's all we had. And watching God multiply that into sitting on 16 acres of property today, over 50,000 square feet of feet feet a building all of it's paid for are you kidding me all of it's paid for some of it's still waiting to be developed into some other things that God I think would have us uh, do in our future but it's not about having to move five different times and finally settling on this property it's not so much about stuff as it is about you and about people like you. We've had the opportunity to, to uh, see so many people come to know Christ in 40 years, be water baptized, baptized with the Holy Spirit. Their lives change. Some of them have moved on to different cities. Some of them still here. Uh, some of them worship at different churches today than uh, 
obviously here, but they're still our brothers, are still our sisters. They still helped us to build what we enjoy today. Even if they left us mad <laughs> and angry, they're still a big part of what we're, what we're celebrating today. That chair you're sitting in, you know, it's a gift from somebody. You know, and we can't begin to name names because as Cindy and I agreed, you're going to leave somebody, somebody out. I have some, though. You got some? Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. So let's do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Before you do it, I was just looking at Mary Jane because Mary Jane and Larry jumped on pretty early in church life. What year was it, Mary Jane? The end of 1980? Really? They became some of our dearest friends and still Larry's in heaven. Mary Jane's up there on the second row and uh, still worshiping God and praising God and hooping and hollering. And, you know, she... And, and, and Mary Jane and Larry came because their oldest son and his wife got born again and they started praying for mom and dad and they started urging them to get into church. And somehow, I don't know how, but somehow they found Believer Center and um, have, have been a big part of the, the building ever since. Yeah, and I just I mentioned Mary Jane because I pulled out a picture the other day. Uh, Hannah threw some pictures from the past on my desk, and I was going through them, and there was one of Mary Jane and, and Larry, and I'm holding a really big striper bass, <laughs> a fish. That we caught down at Elephant Butte Lake. We spent a lot of great time loving each other, praying together, uh, talking the word, uh, building the church together. Many, many years. And so she's just one of the. Many I think faces. about that with, I think it was the um, first or second song we sang this morning about strangers. People come together, strangers as neighbors coming together as one. And, and we all started out as strangers um, to one another. And yet, little by little, week by week, month by month, year by year, God works us into family. And um, if you're willing to give it the time, it, it really doesn't happen in an instant. It, it happens as we go through life together and we, you know, People come in single, and some of them get married, and some of them have children, and then some of them get divorced, and then usually we lose both of them when that happens because it just gets the messy part of it. Um, but we, we do birthdays, and we do funerals, and we do weddings, and we do hospital visits. We, we do all of life together, and, and it takes seasons we go through seasons together um and and our hope has always been that that's the way church started and we want that to be the way that church continues that that we never we never get so comfortable with the people that we know best that we can't embrace the people that we know the least because one day we were the person that wasn't known that came in here, and someone embraced us, and and now it's our turn to be the embracing ones, and and so I do think about I think about Louise. We celebrated her a couple of weeks ago, retiring. Louise was in a Bible study that Marshall was doing on Tuesday nights, and when she found out we were starting the church, she said, "I'm going with you," and and so she's just come alongside there. I think about John and Becky Ross. They came in real early um, with Believer Center, and John just became the guy that we just kept handing more stuff to do um, <laughs> until he finished his part uh, and and handed things off to Phil, who and then Phil and Shirley came in early mm -hmm. and got born again, born again and just just latched onto God. And that was the thing that I remember so much about the early days is that people that came alongside of us, remember, we moved here from Texas. We knew nobody. nobody. We're just doing the best we can to follow after God. And I'm guessing we did some of it good and some of it we totally missed. 
I'm hoping that is covered somehow. By the blood of the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That we don't have to see a video oh, of God. all that we did. Don't you hope that? I mean, let's just keep repenting and repenting and repenting so we don't have to see the bad parts. Just the edited version, God, just, please. Just, just, just the, the good version. stuff, God. Just the good stuff. I have no idea how he's going to work that out. But, but so many people came alongside, and there was such a hunger for God. So we were... That was the thing we had in common. We, we were hungry for God. We needed God. We knew we needed God, and we knew that we didn't know God. And so we needed to get to know God. And so we just dug in to studying Scripture and learning and growing and, and building. And, and truly, that what you see today, 40 years strong, is not the ending. It's just, it's just the right. first... A generation, I believe, of building brick by brick. And God always takes, he takes lives. Yeah. That's what Peter wrote to us, that, that your life and my life is actually a living stone that God builds into his church. And, and where we are all today in that building is we're we're 2,000 years past the foundation that was laid, the scripture says, by the lives of the apostles and prophets. And then every generation, their lives have been laid down to build this church that Jesus said he was going to build. And when you, when you look at the scripture and you look at us, you're like, I don't know how he can even do that. But he, he's doing it, and he's looking, he's always looking for individual lives, us, that we'll put our lives into, become a living stone of what he's building. I still remember the day that, that Don and Shirley invited us to lunch, and we did not know them, the cruises. And somehow they had come to know us. They were long standing members uh, of a church in town that was undergoing transition. And, and so they wanted to talk to us, but they were so concerned that we would think they were church hoppers. I can still remember the, re I don't remember the name of it, but I can still see the restaurant. We're sitting at a table with them and they are so worried that we're going to think they're church, church hoppers. hoppers. They've been in the same place probably for 40 years then and now another 40 years. And, and so it's just amazing to see how many individuals, how many families have come alongside to build to start, really, we started with nothing. We didn't even have a chair. We did not have a chair. I think we had an amplifier and a microphone, your guitar, and a cassette player. Likely. That was and it. Two guitar picks. Two. Two. Two guitar picks. <laughs> yeah. And, and then, then people came along and said, we want to we wanna start nursery we all, we are all having babies, and, and we're like, well, we'd need a building that would have a, another room that we could put nursery in. Okay, let's, let's believe God for another building. So we had moved into a little building. It had a closet. We put the kids in the closet. <laughs> we called it nursery. It was pretty big. Nursery. It was a pretty big closet. But, but then we all had kids, and the closet wasn't big enough, and so, I mean... I don't know, within months of that, oh, before that yeah. lease was up, we had to move another, and there was a room next to the room. There was a room next to the room. And so we started nursery, and then there was a family that said, we want to teach kids. Okay, what do you need? Chairs. Everybody needs chairs. And do you know those kids still need chairs? Still. <laughs> we discovered this week that the kids, the kids' chairs, which we are replacing thanks to your legacy offering, those chairs are at least, Shirley says, 36 years old because they were here when she got here. 
and we had an equal number of red and blue chairs, and now we only have 11 blue chairs, which were the boys' chairs. Yeah. Put it boys. together. <laughs> boys. Because these kids all sat in those chairs. Oh, yeah, I remember <laughs> sitting in those chairs. I sat in them for sure. I probably destroyed at least two. I'm sure. I am sure that <laughs> David Eifert took down at least two chairs. I don't know where we stopped this, okay, because it, the, four decades of people. Right. You know, again, God continues and has continued to add through the years to our family. We have family, church family in Romania, church family in Thailand. Uh, God has just done some, some great things. I think what we, we need to talk about, though, is that we have to keep, we have to keep our mission before us. And we have to continue to decide what's sacred and what's not, what we can change, what we can't change, uh, what we need to refresh. Yeah. You know, and I think that's where we are as a church family is we've been spending a lot of time the last uh, couple of years uh, specifically asking God to renew us and to refresh us. Right. Many of you who are part of the church know we've gone through changes concerning our services uh, we, we went on a mission called Refocus. We pulled uh, our volunteers off the wall for a while because we saw them tired and overworked. And we changed service times to gain strength and refresh. We did a 12.30 for a while. We did a 5 o'clock. We did a 12.30. Then we made the decision last November to come together like this. We're not in retreat. We are just still comp trying to comprehend our next best step as a church family. I have to just pause and say thank you for all of you who are part of Believer Center for still believing in us, tr trusting our uh, wisdom, praying for us to have the right judgment uh, as we're trying to make these decisions. It's not like we don't know what we're doing. We're determined to do the right thing. And uh, we want to continue to win people to Christ. Uh, there are too many empty chairs in the room this morning. And we're going to, I believe God, how many of you will believe with me? We're going to change that. We're going to see that changed. Right. God's going to give us the right strategies to do it. But by and large, it's you and me going out and getting someone. I wish I could get you to promise with me, not, not separate of me, but with me, to, to get just one person this year going to church with you. We would effectively double if we could do that. I, I just don't think we can lay this down and forget it. I think we're going to have to answer to God for it. And I, as a pastor, I want to lead you into it. And so we've just really been putting ourselves before God, right, guys? Yeah, yeah. To say, okay, God, what's our next step? How do we get refreshed? Yeah. How do we? Well, you know, I think uh, Marshall and Cindy are so wonderful. In, in all of these conversations, when we've been thinking about what's next for the church, what, like, 40 years is an amazing accomplishment. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I mean, is. incredible milestone. And when we've talked about it, they've said, it's important to us that this is not some sort of memorial, just m m remembering all the past. But we do believe that uh, remembering is an important part of what we're supposed to do this year, simply because as we believe and as we change and as we uh, strategize, as long as we can keep our heart in this place where we remember how good God has been, it enables us to do ministry, still believing for more, yet at the same time do ministry with full hearts. Because God has been so good to this church. And, and, and that platform, I think, is the thing that makes everything else possible. And coming with a, with a heart of gratitude is actually the best place to make changes instead of discontentment, but instead gratitude. And so thank you, Marshall and Cindy, for uh, indulging us for a few minutes as we oh, remember the church. Pleasure. So amazing. Our pleasure. Yeah. So it's kind of like three words that we're focusing on this week and focusing on this, this year. Number one was remember. We're celebrating how good God has been. And the second one is refresh. Like I said, 40 years is just such an amazing milestone for us. And we, we as the leaders of this church, it's so important to us that we be good stewards of what God has given us. Because this is an amazing honor right, to, to be able to lead this. And we want this church to be something that 
not only we're proud of, but that we are all proud of. Yeah. And so with that comes uh, just continually seeking God in what's next. And so uh, I'm excited to show you what we've just called maybe the 2020 refresh. Uh, we've gone sort of back to the drawing board and thinking about uh, what it is that we're presenting to the city. And uh, we, we were thinking, well, what is our mission as a church. And of course, some language that I've personally gravitated towards is that we are people who present the gospel. That should surprise nobody. That's the mission, the good news message of Jesus. And we communicate that not just through our words, but also through deeds. And so everything that we do and everything that we say is for the purpose of spreading the gospel to the city, and that has all to do with communication. And so what we did, and the creative team did an unbelievable amount of work uh, to make all this possible, but they took this, I'll show you, this is a chat bubble, you know, if you think of, you know, your text, it's a chat bubble, and then they took our existing uh, Believer Center icon and then merged it together with the chat bubble to form this new uh, icon. So the icon, uh, you are going to be seeing all sorts of places, and you might be thinking, a square? You're here to show me a square? Well, it's not just a square. Hopefully, when you see this, you're reminded of what our collective mission is, which is to be people who are presenting the gospel both in word and in deed. And with this, the creative team came up with this whole design package. It's like a, it's a visual identity for the church. And so you can see that these are some of the colors that we've uh, decided on and some of the icons and the, the graphics. So you're going to be seeing those all different places. Everywhere that we present Believer Center to the city, we're wanting to agree with this. So if someone were to come, for example, maybe we're going we're gonna to be doing the app, we're going to be doing uh, the, the website, anything that's designed. And the vision is this, that maybe someone would go and see a Believer Center billboard or go to the app or watch a sermon, and they decide to visit us, that that, that, that uh, visual would, would continue and be consistent uh, throughout. And so uh, just expect there to be changes everywhere that you see Believer Center. We're wanting to tighten up uh, with that. And coming with that is also, we're excited to show you, we're going to be doing uh, Believer Center merch. So you can see, these are just some prototypes. BC80, do you not love that? Oh, I it's my favorite. love that. That's our founding year. It's my favorite. And so we're still working on lots of different designs, but here in the year, we're going to be rolling some things out gradually throughout the year. One of them is going to be merch that you guys uh, can pick up to support us. Yeah. And so I, I just wanted to take a quick second and say that as you see this stuff roll out throughout the year, the creative team has done so much work. However much work you think this kind of stuff is, it's more than that. And we've got an amazing creative team. Of course, it's led by David Goldman, who many of you know. Uh, Dana Cuellar is a huge part of that team. Carlin Allard is a huge part of that team. And so many different volunteers uh, that are making all of this possible. So we just want to say thank you for you guys and all the work that you do. They worked into all hours of the night uh, to get this stuff ready for the year. And it's going to be really exciting. Uh, so, so get ready to see throughout the year uh, maybe these things. Hopefully, wherever you see Believer Center, get used to um, these designs. That's also my favorite. Yeah. I love that. We the like circle. the circle. Um, you know, and he, like he's saying, so much of what we do is word and deed. Word and deed. And we know the word primarily goes out from in here and through you out in the, you know, going to your workplaces and things like that. But in a way that we have it here is Love ABQ. That's, ha- that's part of our deed. It's, it's a huge part of us. It's a part of our DNA. Um, I don't even remember exactly, you'll have to tell me, when we started it. It's had many different phases, many different, it's even had different names. But it's always been key because we care about our city. We care about our city. And that is something that, for me, um, I think about how often, especially here, it's common here, we hear people speak poorly about our city. But it's something even in me that I refuse to do because I love my city. And part of where that starts is in what I say and then what I do. And the way that we do that is through here. One of the ways we can do that is through Love ABQ. And the way we've been doing it is we have our mobile outreach, which happens six times a year. We have our every week someone can, if you need food, you can leave this building with food. And that is key and that's not going away. But a big part of what we're trying to do even this year is expand that. We want to expand that. We want to partner with other people here in Mm -hmm. the city to make sure that happens because Mm -hmm. we want to love our city well. We want to expand in our city. We want to um, constantly be finding new avenues to 
um, love our city in a way that's meaningful and impactful yeah. by learning what it is that they need. Right. Yeah. Right. Very good. And the reason we do that, too, is, is because, it, again, it's part of who God made us. Uh, it, all the way back to the prophet Jeremiah, he says, listen, I want you to pray for the welfare of the city that you live in. And they were in Babylon when he said that to them. He said, I want you, I want you to build houses, plant gardens, have children. I want you to live your life. I want you to increase. And I want you to pray for the good of the city that you live in. And right now in the culture that we live in, it's a lot more popular to curse the place that you live. But that's not how God wants his people to conduct themselves. And even as George said, you guys do this every day. You go out into our city. You're working. You're at school. You're in the marketplace. You're in all these places. And, and you have the opportunity to do good to our city. Look for those opportunities. And then this collective thing that we do together, Love ABQ, we're just looking for ways, always, that we can strengthen that arm. We have a great team of people that love doing this. But can I be honest with you? They need more people. Yeah. They need hands. They need bodies. They need men that will show up six Saturdays a, a year and help us carry bags of groceries right into a neighborhood. We're, we're looking always, there are many great organizations in our city that we're looking for ways to come alongside and partner with so that we can care for our city. Yes. And, we, and we are, even as George said, we, we have always been at the lead of this and we want to stay there. Well, we are not cursing our city, we are caring for our city and the people in our city. We need to be people that love the people where we live. That's who God made Amen. us. So be praying that we would, uh, again, know those connections. Again, we just have a love ABQ is like an umbrella, and feeding and clothing is one part of that. It's the major part of it now. But we want to bring other outreaches and ministries to our city underneath that banner love abq changes to television if you haven't noticed we're no longer on fox uh, we had to make a decision about um, its effectiveness and the money we were spending and again technologies today so we after so many years we've changed over uh, just to streaming and so we're putting more dollars into streaming and the quality of streaming we not only reach our city that way but we reach the world that way uh, through streaming. So we're going to be working. You can help us again by just promoting that word of mouth. You can always d donate to that. If you want to give a little extra to our streaming, you can do that uh, as, as well. So, Yeah, I, I, uh, I think the, the live stream is just such a great thing. And if you're not familiar with what the live stream is, so uh, now you can on the app and on our website and on social media, you can watch our services live if you're not able to make service. And we always want to say that live stream is a wonderful supplement to taking part in the yeah. collective body of Christ. Yeah, yeah. It's not a substitute, but there's lots of times where maybe you're on vacation or right. maybe you're sick or maybe you're traveling and you want to uh, still take a part in the service. It's a great opportunity for you to do that. We know that that is where the world is going, so we're doubling down in our investment to our live stream just to make it as great as possible. And f people have been asking me about the TV program and saying, like, I was ready to watch your sermon and it was like a commercial about dentures. Well, yeah, we're not on the air anymore. <laughs> uh, but if you miss that on Sunday morning, if you've never tried it, you can open up the Believer Center app or you can go to the website and you can watch not just that week's sermon, but all the sermons. And it's higher quality and it's commercial free. It's a much better experience. So really, we'd love for you yeah, to Yeah, and that's not to say we'll never go back right, to it totally. again, but it, very, very expensive. Uh, to be on a half hour of television plus staff time to get to, and, and we don't resent any of that. It's just where we are today, what's a better use, the most efficient use of your dollars, those gifts that you're bringing into us, and right now, anyway, we feel like it's in, 
in streaming. Also, don't forget this in reaching our city, that every um, service we do, especially Sunday morning, we consider not just a place to feed you, but an outreach to our community. These doors are open. And so please help us. Again, uh, invite uh, your friends, coworkers, strangers that you meet uh, to service. You don't have to save them. Just invite them. And uh, let's believe God together that they... They, they, if they need saving, that, that happens. But uh, we're doing that. And that's just, uh, you know, we're, we're anticipating 2020, God, to really open up some opportunities for us that we've not seen or we've not enjoyed uh, in reaching more and more souls. The church reaches the soul of man, reaches to his spirit. And all the other great organizations, charities, nonprofits, can't touch that. Only the church can touch that. And we urge you to really help us with that. And resolve really is the next word, I think, that we, we came kind of settled on resolved. For all of us to do this, this is something we all uh, have to make ourselves a part of in order for it. They're not mad. They're not leaving. They, they're getting ready for us to close. Because some of you look really worried. I have to tell you, some of you went, boy. Touchy, touchy. <laughs> no. But this is very, very important. Let me say it, and then we'll close service, is that um, I, we, we just can't do it without uh, every uh, person doing their part, doing their financial part. You know, uh, giving is way off has been the last couple of years because attendance has been off for the most part. But we need your financial help. We certainly need you, you to volunteer to help where you can in some of these incredible areas of outreach that we have and helping us increase that going forward. Uh, you know, all, all those areas, we just simply need every person to say, you know, this is my church family. If it is, to say, this is my church family. I'm a part of this. And I'm going to do my part, God is my help, to make this thing a success. We're going to reach more people than we've ever reached before. Not only here and see them added to the church and, and becoming disciples of Christ, but we're going to reach more nations. We're, going to, we're just going to, we're going to take, help me with this, we're going to take the lid off if we've had a lid on God. We're going to take it off. I want you to take it off where your life is concerned. I want you to fulfill the destiny God has for you. But beyond that, we have a destiny corporately that we, God wants us to honor. And God is holding us accountable for it. That's why he raised us up. So we're just urging you to, uh, we need you. I don't know how else to say it. Can any of you say it a different way? We absolutely need you. The necessity is actually by God's design. We need you. If you're a believer, and in particular, if you believe God has set you at Believer Center of Albuquerque, we absolutely need you going forward. If, you've already, if you're already in, you know, all, both feet all the way, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for what you already do. But we don't, we don't think it's fair, and neither does God, that you just take on more. We believe God wants all of us to take on our part and with that, we can do more than we've ever accomplished before, okay? So I hope you're excited as we are about 2020 and the, the freshness of the year. There's just something a little different about 2020. It's not the elections. That seems to be the same. There's something different about 2020, spiritually speaking. And you're breathing. Your heart is beating God is doing something great in you, and he wants to do something great through you, or even greater. That's really the word, greater than what we've all enjoyed before. I want to encourage you. Heads up. Be ready. Be prepared. Uh, elevate, again, your relationship with God if that needs to happen. Elevate your relationship to the church if that's what needs to happen and whatever else needs to happen to, to resolve. Say it with me. Resolve. Resolve. You know what the word means, to resolve yourself to uh, uh, being a part of the local church, uh, certainly at Believer Center, and let's do everything we can to have our greatest 
impact to date. 40 years is glorious. Hallelujah. But the best, you've heard it said, the best is before us. And I want us to resolve to do that. Amen. Again, we're about to put some tools in your hand. David will talk about that. I just want to tell you that in September, which is where we celebrate the church's birthday, we have a special conference that we have, we're going to do the weekend, the third weekend, beginning the 18th, I believe it is. Do we have that? Oh, good. All right, great. 18th, 19th, and 20th. And already Pastor Charles Neiman, my pastor, who's invested so much in us here in Albuquerque, uh, in the work here, has already consented to be with us. We're going to kick it off on a Friday night. It will go a Saturday afternoon, a Saturday night, and then we'll have Sunday morning. Pastor Neiman is going to be here. We invited personally this past week Pastor Tommy Barnett, who is uh, pastor of the great um, you know, church in Phoenix and also such a huge part of Dream Center L.A. We, we actually support that work in L.A. financially every month now. And we've asked him, it's looking good. And Pastor Charles promised me, who is really close to Pastor Tommy, that he's going to work really hard to get Pastor Tommy here too for us. And then I've got friends coming in from um, all over. Even We're going to even invite some of our past staff members. Some of them may not come, but some of them will. And we're just going to have a great party that weekend. But we're going to be working hard every month to get to September. And we're going to believe God for great increase even before we get there. Okay? Cindy. I, I just want to echo what um, Mark, some of what Marshall said in his opening segment to us as the church. You know, last week, not only were we in Colorado, we were also in El Paso for a meeting. And Marshall and I were sitting at a table um, in a pastor's meeting. We're sitting with Pastor Tommy Barnett. We're sitting with Pastor Charles. We're sitting with Brian Houston and other great pastors. And the, the concern and the conversation at the table for the church and how the church seems to be taking on its identity from what the world yeah. thinks about us rather than what God thinks about us is of great concern. And you may say, well, I don't think that. Well, just be on guard. Be sure that you're reading what God says about you because the culture of our day is to devalue the gathering of the church of Jesus Christ. It's to say it's of no rel relevance at all, that it has nothing to contribute. And those are not things that God says. That's how the Antichrist spirit evaluates the church. And, and that can come into us. I just want to remind you, these are things that came to me actually in the airport, and I jotted them down really, really quick here. Um, about this, that it's gone. Um, that God promised to Abraham that he would make of him a great assembly of people, not that he would make him a great man. And sometime today, we, in our day, we live so much for the individual advancement that we forget that God does advance our lives, but he puts us in his church. And, I, and it's very easy to think, well, it doesn't really matter if I show up or not. It really doesn't matter if I'm there. I mean, we're just, you know, we just have to get dressed and drive to church and sit in a room and sit in a chair. And, and that, it doesn't really matter. And, and I just want to say to you, that's a lie. It does matter. It really matters. It, it really matters. It matters to your life and it matters to God. And it's not just about coming in the building and acting like nice people. This isn't the end. This is the beginning. The ending is not to get everybody in the building. The, the beginning is to get us equipped to be the light yeah. of Jesus to the world. And we're not going to get that in the world. No. We actually have to join together. This isn't the end. This is the beginning. You're, you're about to leave here, and you're going into the world as the light. God just has a 
different perspective than the world has about you. And we have to fight to keep the perspective of God. And we have to fight to keep the perspective of each other and not just see each other as ordinary, unchanged Mm. human beings. Mm. That's what we look like to the outside, but that's not who God calls us. And if, if we as pastors could do anything today, it would be to encourage you to see yourself as God sees you and to see your place in his church as of greater value than you're currently being given. Mm-hmm. And to not abandon. Just don't, it's not the time to abandon. It's not the time to take as many weeks off as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. It's, maybe it's just the time for us to stretch a little bit further and to dig a little bit deeper and to reach a little bit broader and higher to see what God wants next. Amen.